it was a joyous occasion for me. After the races were over, I felt like now I'm here to get busy to do what I came to the games to do. I was extremely proud of these courageous and committed athletes. It was a damn gutsy thing to do. Nobody had any idea what was going to follow, but nobody thought good things were going to happen. They felt that we was a uh, cancer to society, you might say. Throughout the 1960s and leading up to the 1968 Olympics, many sportsmen and women in the USA were grappling with how to reflect social and political injustices. For John Carlos and Tommy Smith, October the 16th, 1968, would become the day they chose to make a statement and send a message. Even in the context of the entire 20th century, 1968 was a turbulent year. The Prague Spring in the former Czechoslovakia the Tet Offensive, a turning point of the Vietnam War. Student killings in Orangeburg, South Carolina by police. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. Senator Bobby Kennedy, brother of President John F. Kennedy, is murdered. Dozens are killed protesting in Mexico City ten days before the Olympics begin. And then, on October 12th, the Games themselves begin. This moment, this image almost never happened. Well, I actually wanted to boycott, but, you know, personally, I wanted to boycott. Uh, to be honest with you, I was kind of disenchanted that we couldn't come together as a unit, as one, uh, to make a statement. John Carlos took bronze in the 1968 Men's Olympic 200-metre final. Tommy Smith won gold. Six months prior to the 68 Games, John Carlos had been minded to boycott the Olympics following a brief meeting with Dr. Martin Luther King. I met Dr. King uh, that April, and some things that he expressed to me were profound. Uh, first of all, Dr. King was going to come out and support the Olympic boycott. When you look now, he didn't make it. Why did John Carlos, along with Tommy Smith, do what they did? A boycott wouldn't serve their purpose, the message needed. Carlos was a student of San Jose State University, Dr. Harry Edwards, a civil rights activist and architect of the Olympic project for human rights, was also at San Jose. The Olympic project for human rights um, emerged uh, with the goal of making sure that everybody understood the nature of what we were up against here. It wasn't just voting, voting rights. It wasn't just desegregation of schools. It wasn't just job opportunities and equal housing. It was human rights. You don't have to kill or maim anyone to make the statement, and you can get the attention of the world. And that's exactly what took place in Mexico. The race itself, the men's 200 metres final, was to end with a world record. A moment in history replaced by another that is still as powerful as ever over 50 years later. Tommy Smith of the USA would win. Australian Peter Norman would split the two Americans as John Carlos's dream of a gold medal fell away, a bronze nonetheless. Well, it, it was a joyous occasion for me, based on the fact that after the races were over, I felt like now I'm here to get busy to do what I came to the games to do, to make a statement. Uh, I was excited about the fact that we had won our races, now we're going to the Olympics uh, victory stand, and I was excited to the point where I was saying, yeah, now it's time to get busy. Although John Carlos and Tommy Smith had planned for some time to make a statement on the victory podium, it wasn't until 30 minutes before they went to be presented with their medals, they finalised their message. We didn't just want to go to the stand, we wanted to have certain things to symbolise certain things that we were standing for. So, you know, Mr. Smith said he had some gloves, I said, bring them. I had beads, bring them. He had a black scarf, bring them. I had a black uh, sweater to cover up my jersey, bring them. Uh, we all were wearing black socks, basically. And uh, we decided that we wasn't going to wear any shoes out there uh, to illustrate poverty. I was extremely proud of these courageous and committed athletes. I was even prouder to have been associated with them and to have led the movement that uh, put them uh, um, in that uh, political and mental space uh, where they saw the necessity of doing that, uh, given what we were dealing with in this country in 1968. Peter Norman's life also changed that day in October 1968. A white sprinter from Australia 
he backed Smith and Carlos to the annoyance of many in his country. He wore an Olympic Project for Human Rights badge on the podium. He dared, in a small way, to join the protest. There were boos, there were cheers, there were whistles, there were catcalls, there was, there was every type of emotion that you could imagine that went around that stand. Um, while Tommy and John proudly demonstrated for what they believed in more than anything else in the world at that time. Those two giants of men on that day um, told the world exactly where they stood. Watching from the stands as Smith, Norman and Carlos received their medals, a key member of the US men's rowing eights, which was in effect a Harvard University team, which had angered the US Olympic Committee by allying itself with Harry Edwards and the Olympic Project for Human Rights. Was it the call for the revolt? Was it a call for liberation? Was it a call uh, of, of anger? It was all those things. You know, you have to salute them for that. And, and I felt that I felt that at the time. It was a gutsy, damn, a damn gutsy thing to do. Nobody had any idea what was going to follow, but nobody thought good things were going to happen. And how all their actions provoked the U.S. Olympic Committee, a committee utterly opposed to any protest at the Mexico Olympics. For John Carlos and Tommy Smith, a divided America brought vitriolic responses for them both. The IOC forced the U.S. Olympic Committee to expel the two and send them home. It was no big thing that they kicked us out of the village. So what they did, they whitewashed all of the, all of the, you might say, commentary. All of the literature was written about that particular statement. They didn't want the athletes to get a feel for what people were saying around the world relative to that statement. The fallout continued. The rowers, for expressing their views, were the subject of an astonishing letter. The U.S. Olympic Committee President Douglas Roby was vehemently opposed to their actions. Paul Hoffman reads the letter. What I have not been able to understand is why, with the selection of the Harvard eight org crew to represent the United States at the Olympic Games, most of these crew members immediately expelled from their minds the purpose and objective for which they were selected and embarked on a rather strenuous program of civil rights and social justice with other members of our Olympic delegation to Mexico City. For I feel that the miserable performance of you and your crew at Mexico City will stand as a permanent record against you and the athletes which you led. As a boy, I had great admiration and respect for Harvard and the men it produced. Certainly serious intellectual degeneration has taken place in this once great university. I was, I think, dumbfounded. I mean, you know, sometimes you, you get these, uh, you know, I, um, it, it amazed me rather. And, and now I, I laugh about it because it's so blatant. You know, there's nothing subtle about the letter. It, it's built in it, um, sort of all the language of white supremacy. Peter Norman returned to Australia. His support of Smith and Carlos found few who saw his actions as heroic. He never ran at an Olympics again. His death in 2006 saw both John Carlos and Tommy Smith act as pallbearers. He received a posthumous parliamentary apology in 2012. It was... Uh, acknowledging the importance of Peter Norman, uh, the uh, uh, greatness of his athletic achievement, the heroism of what he did on the dais, uh, and recognising that he should have been better treated when he came back to Australia, uh, that his shabby treatment when he came back to Australia uh, didn't befit one of our great campaigners for racial justice. Welcome to the White House. Just before President Obama left office, in late 2016, he welcomed the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic teams to the White House. We're honored to have here the legendary Tommy Smith and John Carlos here today. In 1968, the thought of Smith and Carlos being welcomed to the White House was inconceivable. You know, their, their, their powerful silent protest uh, in the 1968 Games was controversial, but it woke folks up. That was 2016. The same year, NFL star and San Francisco 49er Colin Kaepernick felt it was needed for him to take a knee during the U.S. national anthem in protest at police brutality and racial inequality. Project the outcome, but we don't have fun. Yeah, if you do that, you're going to be all right. You're going to be fine. Cool. Hey, brother, I love you. I love you so much. Hang love you too, brother. Smith. Over half a century has passed. Although at the time the message was interpreted as black power, in latter years Tommy Smith referred to it as a human rights salute. With the murder of George Floyd and others, this moment 
this image from over 50 years ago not only retains resonance, but perhaps has never been more relevant. Geraint you, Sky Sports.